You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. And please, if you can, try to purchase your books at either SteinerBooks.org or RudolfSteinerPress.com. It helps uh, keep the English translations of Steiner flowing. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Harmony of the Creative Word, the Human Being and the Elemental, Animal, Plant and Mineral Kingdoms, 12 lectures in four parts, formerly known as Man as Symphony of the Creative Word, Collected Works, Volume 230, Revised Translation by Matthew Barton. This is the second part of Part 3, entitled The Plant World and the Elemental Nature Spirits. This is Lecture 8, given on the 3rd of November, 1923. Yesterday I spoke to you about the other side of the natural world, about the supersensible and invisible beings which accompany the beings and processes visible to the senses. An earlier instinctive vision beheld the beings of the supersensible world as well as those in the world of the senses. Today these beings have withdrawn from human view. The reason why this company of gnomes, undines, sylphs and fire spirits is not perceptible in the same way as animals, plants and so on is merely that man in the present epoch of his earth evolution is not in a position to unfold his soul and spirit without the help of his physical and ether bodies. In the present situation of earth evolution, man is obliged to depend on the etheric body for the purposes of his soul and on the physical body for the purposes of his spirit. The physical body which provides the instrument for the spirit, that is the sensory apparatus, is not able to enter into communication with the beings that exist behind the physical world. It is the same with the etheric body, which man needs to develop as an ensouled being. Through this, if I may put it so, half of his earthly environment escapes him. He passes over everything connected with the elemental beings about which I spoke yesterday. The physical and the ether body have no access to this world. We can gain an idea of what actually escapes human beings today when we realize what such gnomes, undines, and so on actually are. We have, you see, a whole host of lower animals, lower at the present time, animals that consist only of a soft mass, live in the fluid element, and have nothing in the way of a skeleton to give them internal support. They are creatures which belong to the latest phase of the earth's development, creatures which only now, when the earth has already evolved, develop what man, the oldest earth being, already developed in his head structure during the time of ancient Saturn. These creatures have not progressed to the stage of producing the hardened substance in them that can become supporting skeleton. It is the gnomes which in a spiritual way make up in the world for what is lacking in the lower orders of the animals up to the amphibians and fish which have only the beginnings of a skeleton. These lower animal orders only become complete, as it were, through the fact that gnomes exist. The relationships between beings in the world are very different, and something arises between these lower creatures and the gnomes, which I yesterday called antipathy. The gnomes do not wish to become like these lower creatures. They are continually on the watch to protect themselves from assuming their form. As I described to you, the gnomes are extraordinarily clever, intelligent beings. With them, intelligence is already implicit in perception. They are, in every respect, the antithesis of the lower animal world. And whereas they have the significance for plant growth, which I described yesterday, in the case of the lower animal world, 
they actually provide its complement. They supply what this lower animal world does not possess. This lower animal world has a dull consciousness. The gnomes have a consciousness of the utmost clarity. The lower animals have no bony skeleton, no bony support. The gnomes bind together everything that exists by way of gravity and fashion their bodies from this volatile, invisible force. Bodies which are, moreover, in constant danger of disintegrating, of losing their substance. The gnomes must ever and again create themselves anew out of gravity because they continually stand in danger of losing their substance. Because of this, in order to save their own existence, the gnomes are constantly attentive to what is going on around them. No being is a more attentive observer on earth than a gnome. It takes note of everything for it must know everything, grasp everything, in order to preserve its existence. A gnome must always be wide awake. If it were to become sleepy, as people often do, this sleepiness would immediately cause its death. There is a German saying of very early origin, which aptly expresses this characteristic of the gnomes, in having always to remain attentive. People say, look sharp, like a goblin and the gnomes are goblins. So if one wishes to make someone attentive, one says to him, look sharp like a gnome. A gnome is really an attentive being. If one could place a gnome as an object lesson on a front desk in every school classroom where all could see it, it would be a splendid example for the children to follow. The gnomes have yet another characteristic. They are filled with an absolutely unconquerable lust for independence. They trouble themselves little about one another and give their attention only to the world of their own surroundings. One gnome takes little interest in another. But everything else in this world around them, in which they live, this interests them exceedingly. Now I told you that the human body really is a hindrance to our perceiving such folk as these. The moment it ceases to be this hindrance, these beings are there, just as the other beings of nature are there for ordinary vision. Anyone who gets to the stage of experiencing his dreams in full consciousness on falling asleep is well acquainted with the gnomes. You need only recall what I recently published in the title Gertianum on the subject of dreams. Uh, Footnote, it is also in the book On the Life of the Soul at the Pacific Press, New York, 1985, end of footnote. I said that a dream in no way appears to ordinary consciousness in its true form, but wears a mask. Such a mask is worn by the dream that we have on falling asleep. We do not immediately escape from the experience of our ordinary day consciousness. Reminiscences well up, memory pictures from life, or we perceive symbols representing the internal organs, the heart as a stove, the lungs as wings, all in symbolic form. These are masks. If someone were to see a dream unmasked, if he were actually to pass into the world of sleep without the beings existing there being masked, then at the moment of falling asleep, he would behold a whole host of goblins coming toward him. In ordinary consciousness, man is protected from seeing these things unprepared, for they would terrify him. The form in which they would appear would actually be reflections, images of all the qualities in the individual concerned that work as forces of destruction. He would perceive all the destructive forces within him, all that continually destroys. These gnomes, if perceived unprepared, would be nothing but symbols of death. Man would be terribly alarmed by them if in ordinary consciousness he knew nothing about them and was now confronted by them on falling asleep. He would feel entombed by them, for this is how it would appear, entombed by them yonder in the astral world. For seen from the other side, what takes place on falling asleep 
is a kind of entombment of gnomes. This holds good only for the moment of falling asleep. A further compliment to the physical, sense-perceptible world is given by the undines, the water beings, which continually transform themselves and which live in connection with water just as the gnomes live in connection with the earth. These undines, we have come to know the role they play in plant growth, exist as complementary beings to animals that are at a somewhat higher stage and have assumed a more differentiated earthly body. These animals, which have developed into the more evolved fishes or also into the more evolved amphibians, require scales, require some sort of hard external armor. For the powers needed to provide certain creatures with this outer support, this outer skeleton, the world is indebted to the activity of the undines. The gnomes spiritually support the creatures which are at quite a low evolutionary stage. The creatures which must be supported externally, which must be clad in a kind of armor, owe their protective armor to the activity of the undines. Thus it is the undines which impart to these somewhat higher animals in a primitive way what we have in the cranial part of the skull. They make them, as it were, into heads. All the beings that are invisibly present behind the visible world have their vital task in the great scheme of things. You will always notice that materialistic science breaks down when one tries to use it to explain something of the kind I have just described. It cannot be used, for instance, to explain how the lower creatures, which are scarcely any more solid than the element in which they live, manage to propel themselves forward in it, because the scientists do not know about the spiritual support provided by the gnomes. Equally, the development of an external shell will always present a problem to purely materialistic scientists because they do not know that the undines in their sensitivity to and avoidance of their own tendency to become lower animals cast off what then appears on the somewhat higher animals as scales or some other kind of outer shell. Again, in the case of these elemental beings, It is only our body which hinders the ordinary consciousness of today from seeing them just as it sees the leaves of plants, for example, or the somewhat higher animals. When, however, man falls into a state of deep, dreamless sleep, and yet his sleep is not dreamless, because through the gift of inspiration it has become transparent, then his spiritual gaze perceives the undines rising up out of that astral sea in which, on falling asleep, he was engulfed, submerged by the gnomes. In deep sleep, the undines become visible. Sleep extinguishes ordinary consciousness, but the sleep which is illumined by clear consciousness is filled with the wonderful world of ever-changing fluidity, a fluidity that rises up in all kinds of ways to create the metamorphoses of the undines. Just as our day consciousness perceives creatures around us that have firm contours, a clear night consciousness would present to us these ever-changing beings, which themselves rise up and sink down again like the waves of the sea. All deep sleep is filled with a moving sea of living beings, a moving sea of undines all around the human being. It is different in the case of the sylphs. In a way they also complement the being of certain animals, but now in the other direction. The gnomes and undines add what is of the nature of the head to the animals where this is lacking. Birds, however, as I described to you, are actually pure head. They are already head organization. The sylphs add to the birds in a spiritual way, what they lack as the physical complement of their head organization. They complement the bird kingdom with what corresponds to the metabolism and limbs in man. 
if the birds fly about in the air with atrophied legs, so much the more powerfully developed is the limb system of the sylphs. They may be said to represent in the air, in a spiritual way, what the cow represents below in physical matter. This is why I was able to say yesterday that it is in connection with the birds that the sylphs have their ego, have what connects them with the earth. Man acquires his ego on the earth. What connects the sylphs with the earth is the bird kingdom. The sylphs are indebted to the bird kingdom for their ego, or at least for the consciousness of their ego. Now, when someone has slept through the night, has had around him the astral sea that gives rise to the most manifold undine forms, and then perceives a dream on awakening, if this dream he wakes up to were not masked in things reminiscent of life or symbolical representations of the organs, if he were to see the unmasked dream, he would be confronted by the world of the sylphs. But these sylphs would assume for him a strange form. They would appear much as the sun might if it wished to send to human beings something which would affect them strangely, something which would have a soporific spiritual effect on their sleep. We shall hear in a moment why this is so. If someone were to perceive his unmasked dream on awakening, he would see light fluttering toward him, the essence of light fluttering toward him. He would find this an unpleasant experience, particularly also because the limbs of these sylphs would, as it were, spin and weave around him. He would feel as though the light were attacking him from all sides as if the light were something that beset him and to which he was extraordinarily sensitive. Now and then he would perhaps also feel this to be like a caress from the light. What I really wish to indicate here is only that the light, with its upholding, gently touching quality, actually approaches in the sylph's form. When we come to the fire spirits, we find that they complement the fleeting nature of the butterflies. A butterfly itself develops as little as possible of its actual physical body. It leaves this as tenuous as possible. It is a creature of light. The fire spirits appear as beings which complement the butterfly's body, so that we can get the following impression. If, on the one hand, we had a physical butterfly before us, and pictured it suitably enlarged, and on the other hand a fire spirit. They are, it is true, rarely together, except in the circumstances which I mentioned to you yesterday. Then, if these two were welded together, we would get something resembling a winged human being, actually a winged human being. We need only increase the size of the butterfly and adapt the size of the fire spirit to human proportions. And from this we would get something like a winged human being. This again shows that the fire spirits are in fact the complement to creatures nearest to what is spiritual. They complement them, so to say, in a downward direction. Gnomes and undines complement in an upward direction, toward the head. Sylphs and fire spirits complement the birds and butterflies in a downward direction. Thus the fire spirits must be seen in connection with the butterflies. Now in the same way that man can, as it were, penetrate the dreams of sleep, so he can also penetrate waking day life. But here he makes use of his physical body in quite a robust way. This too I have described in essays in the title Gertianum. When he does this, man is totally unable to realize that he would, if he could, actually always see the fire spirits in his waking life. For the fire spirits are inwardly related to his thoughts, to everything which proceeds from the organization of the head. But when someone has progressed so far that he can remain completely in waking consciousness, but nevertheless stand in a certain sense outside himself, viewing himself from outside as a thinking being, 
while standing firmly on the earth, then he will become aware how the fire spirits are the element in the world which makes our thoughts perceptible from the other side. Thus the perceiving of the fire spirits can enable man to see himself as thinker, not merely to be the thinker, and as such hatch out thoughts, but actually to behold how the thoughts run their course. In that case, however, thoughts cease to be bound to the human being. They reveal themselves to be world thoughts. They are active and move as impulses in the world. Then one finds that the human head only calls forth the illusion that thoughts are enclosed inside the skull. They are only reflected there. Their mirrored images are there. What underlies these thoughts belongs to the sphere of the fire spirits. On entering this sphere, one sees thoughts to be not only what they are in themselves, but the thought content of the world, which at the same time is actually rich in imaginative content. The power to stand outside oneself is the power that enables one to arrive at the realization that thoughts are world thoughts. I venture to add, when we behold what is to be seen upon the earth, not from a human body, but from the sphere of the fire spirits, that is, from the Saturn nature that projects into the earth, as it were, then we gain exactly the picture of the evolution of the earth, which I have described in title Occult Science and Outline. This book is actually so composed that the thoughts appear as the thought content of the world, seen from the perspective of the fire spirits. You see, these things do have a deep and real significance, but they also have a deep and real significance for man in other ways. Take the gnomes and undines. They exist in the world, one can say, which borders on human consciousness. They are already beyond the threshold. Ordinary consciousness is protected from seeing these beings, but the fact is that these beings are not all benevolent. The benevolent beings are, for instance, those which I described yesterday as working in the most varied ways on plant growth. But not all these beings are well disposed. And the moment one breaks through into the world where they are active, one finds there not only the well disposed beings, but the malevolent ones as well. One must first form a conception about which of them are well disposed and which of them malevolent. This is not so easy, as you will see from the way I must describe the malevolent ones. The main difference between the ill-disposed and the well-disposed is that the latter are always drawn more to the plant and mineral kingdoms, whereas the ill-disposed are drawn to the animal and human kingdoms. Some, which are even more malevolent, try to approach the kingdoms of the plants and the minerals as well. But one can gain quite a fair idea of the malevolence which the beings of this realm can have when one turns to those who are drawn to human beings and animals, who in particular try to accomplish in man what the higher hierarchies entrust to the well-disposed beings for the plant and mineral world. You see, there exist ill-disposed beings from the realm of the gnomes and undines, which approach human beings and animals and cause the complement with which they are supposed to endow only the lower animals to come to physical realization in human beings. This element is already present in man, but their aim is that it should be manifested physically in human beings and also in animals. Through the presence of these malevolent gnome and undine beings, animal and plant life of a low order, parasites, live in human beings and in animals. These malevolent beings are the begetters of parasites. The moment man crosses the threshold of the spiritual world, he at once meets the trickery that exists in this world. Snares are everywhere, and he must first learn something from the goblins, namely to be attentive. This is something that spiritualists, for example, can never manage. Everywhere there are snares. Now, someone might say, 
Why then are these malevolent gnome and undine beings there, if they engender parasites? Well, if they were not there, man would never be able to develop within himself the power to evolve brain substance. And here we meet something of extraordinary significance. If you think of the human being as consisting of metabolism and limbs of the chest, that is the rhythmical system, and then the head, that is the system of nerves and senses, there are certain things about which you must be quite clear. Down below, processes are taking place. Let us leave out the rhythmical sphere. And above, processes are taking place. If you look at the processes taking place below as a whole, you find that in ordinary life they have one result that is usually disregarded. These, these processes are those of elimination through the intestines, through the kidneys, and so on. And all of them have their outlet in a downward direction. They are mostly regarded simply as processes of elimination. But this is nonsense. Elimination does not take place merely in order to eliminate. But to the same degree in which the products of elimination arise, something arises spiritually in the lower sphere of man which resembles what the brain is physically above. What occurs in the lower man is a process arrested halfway as far as its physical development is concerned. Elimination takes place because the process passes over into the spiritual. In man's upper sphere, the process is taken to its conclusion. What below is only spiritual there assumes physical form. Above we have the physical brain, below a spiritual brain. And if what is eliminated below were to be subjected to a further process, if one were to continue the transformation, then ultimately such metamorphosis would give rise to the human brain. The human brain is the further evolved product of elimination. This is something which is of immense importance in regard to medicine, for instance, and it is something of which doctors in the 16th and 17th centuries were still fully aware. Of course, today people speak in a very derogatory manner, and rightly in many respects, of the quote, quote, quacks of old who dealt in filth, close quote. But this is because they do not know that such filth still contained in quotes mummies of the spirit. Naturally, this is not intended as a glorification of what is figured as quackery in past centuries. But I am referring to the many truths with connections as deep as those I have just cited. The brain is a higher metamorphosis of the products of elimination. Hence the connection between diseases of the brain and intestinal diseases and also their cure. You see, because gnomes and undines exist, because there is a world in which they are able to live, the forces exist that are certainly capable of giving rise to parasites in man's lower sphere. But at the same time, in man's upper sphere, this gives rise to metamorphosis into the brain of the products of elimination. It would be absolutely impossible for us to have a brain if the world were not so ordered that gnomes and undines can exist. What holds good for gnomes and undines in regard to destructive powers, for destruction and disintegration also proceed from the brain, holds good for sylphs and fire spirits in regard to regenerative powers. Here again the well-disposed sylphs and fire spirits keep away from human beings and animals and busy themselves with plant growth in the way I have indicated. But there are also those who are malevolent. These ill-disposed beings are, above all, concerned in carrying what should only have its place up above in the regions of air and warmth down into the watery and earthy regions. Now, if you wish to study what happens when these sylph beings carry what belongs up above down into the watery and earthy regions, look at the deadly nightshade, Atropa belladonna. The flower of this plant, if I may put it so, has been kissed by the sylph. 
and what could be beneficent juices have been changed into poisonous ones. Now, excuse me, here you have what may be called a displacement of spheres. It is right when the sylphs develop their enveloping forces up above, as I have already described, where the light literally comes and touches you all over, for the bird world needs this. But if the sylph descends and makes use in the plant world below of what it should employ up above, a potent vegetable poison is engendered. Parasitic beings arise through gnomes and undines, and through sylphs arise the poisons, which are in fact a heavenly element which has streamed down too far, has descended to earth. When people or or certain animals eat the fruit of the deadly nightshade, which looks like a cherry, except that it conceals itself in the calyx, it is pushed down, you can see what I have just described when you look at the plant, When people or certain animals eat the berry, it is fatal to them. But just look at the thrushes and blackbirds. They perch on the plant and get from it the best food in the world. What is present in the belladonna belongs rightly to the sphere they inhabit. It is a remarkable thing that animals and human beings, whose lower organs are earthbound, should experience as poison what has become corrupted on the earth in the deadly nightshade. Yet birds, such as thrushes and blackbirds, which should really get this in a spiritual way from the sylphs, and indeed through the benevolent sylphs, do so obtain it, are able to assimilate something that has been thrust down to the earth from their region above. They find nourishment in what is poison for beings more bound to the earth. Thus you get a conception of how gnomes and undines impel what is of a parasitic nature to strive upward from the earth toward other beings, while poisons, on the other hand, filter downward from above. And when the fire spirits imbue themselves with the impulses that belong in the region of the butterflies and are of great use to them in their development, when the fire spirits carry those impulses down into the fruits, we get the poisonous almonds that are found in some species of almond. The poison is carried into the fruit of the almond trees through the activity of the fire spirits, and yet the fruit of the almond could not come into existence at all if those same fire spirits did not in a beneficial way burn, as it were, what is the edible part in other fruits. Only look at the almond. With other fruits... You have the white kernel at the center and around it the flesh of the fruit. With the almond you have the kernel there in the center and around it the flesh of the fruit is quite burnt up. That is the activity of the fire spirits. And if this activity miscarries, if what the fire spirits are bringing about is not confined to the brown shell where their activity can still be beneficial, and something of what should be engaged in developing the shell penetrates into the white kernel, then the almond becomes poisonous. And so you have gained a picture of the beings lying immediately beyond the threshold of normal awareness, and of how, if they follow their impulses, they become the bearers of parasitic and poisonous principles, and therewith of illnesses. Now it becomes clear how, when healthy, we raise ourselves above the forces we ta- that take hold of us in illness. For illness springs from the malevolence of the beings necessary for the regeneration of the world of nature, for its shooting and sprouting growth, but also for its fading and decay. These are the things which, arising from instinctive clairvoyance, underlie such intuitions as those of the Indian Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Brahma represented the being at work in the cosmic sphere, which may legitimately approach man. Vishnu represented the cosmic sphere, which may only approach man insofar as what has been built up must again be broken down, insofar as it must be continually transformed. Shiva represented everything connected with the forces of destruction, 
And in the ancient times of the flowering of Indian civilization, it was said, quote, Brahma is intimately related to all that is of the nature of the fire spirits and the sylphs. Vishnu with all that is of the nature of sylphs and undines. Shiva with all that is of the nature of undines and gnomes. Close quote. Generally speaking, when we go back to these more ancient conceptions, we find everywhere the pictorial expressions for what must be sought today as imminent in the secrets of nature. Yesterday we studied the connection of these invisible folk with the plant world. Today we have added their connection with the world of the animals. Everywhere beings on this side of the threshold interact with those from beyond it, and vice versa. Only when one knows the living interaction of both these kinds of beings does one really understand how the visible world unfolds. Knowledge of the supersensible world is indeed very, very necessary for man. For the moment he passes through the gate of death, He no longer has the sense-perceptible world around him, but initially this other world begins to be his world. At his present stage of evolution, man cannot find correct access to the other world unless he has recognized in physical manifestations the written characters which point to this other world. If he has not learned to read in the creatures of the earth, in the creatures of the water, in the creatures of the air, and in what I'd like to call the creatures of the light, the butterflies, the signs of elemental beings which are our companions between death and a new birth. What we see of the creatures here between birth and death is, so to speak, their crude, dense part. We only learn to recognize what belongs to them as their supersensible nature when, with insight and understanding, we enter into this supersensible world. The end of Lecture 8